is, it is a gift and privilege to welcome Dr. Larisha Hawkins to the University of Chicago Divinity School for the Black History Month speaker series. Dr. Hawkins teaches and researches at the University of Virginia, where she holds joint appointments in the politics and religious studies departments. She also serves as faculty fellow at the university's Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture, is a contributor to the project on lived theology, and co-convenes the Henry Luce Foundation Project, uh, Religion and Its Publics. In 2013, Professor Hawkins became the first African-American uh, woman tenured professor at Wheaton College, a Christian Protestant liberal arts uh, college. Two years later, in response to rising ethnic tensions, Professor Hawkins declared her intent to don a hijab in, in embodied solidarity with Muslim sisters throughout the Christian season of Advent on social media. This initiated conversations about the nature of God and the possibilities of multi-faith solidarity at a time when Islamophobia, xenophobia, racism, and hate crimes motivated by religious differences were more prolific than at any uh, time in recent history. Within five days of her post, she was placed on administrative leave at Wheaton College. And her story is documented in a New York Times Magazine feature, The Professor Who Wore uh, a Hijab in Solidarity Then lo Lost Her Job. And is the subject of the film, Same God, by Midget Productions. Professor Hawkins is co-author of Religion and American Politics, Classic and Contemporary Perspectives, the first edition, which explores the influence of religion on America's political history, institutions, and culture. She is also a contributing author to Black Scholars in White Space, a cross-disciplinary volume that highlights the scholarly contributions of African American scholars working in Christi Christian higher education. Dr. Hawkins received her BA in history and sociology from Rice University and earned her MPA and PhD from the University of Oklahoma. The title of her lection, lecture this afternoon is Of Hijabs and Hoodies, Black Epiphanies in the Trump Epic. In addition to her numerous academic accomplishments, many of us know Dr. Hawkins as a mentor and role model, someone who embodies faith and intellectual inquiry in her own personal life as well as the public domain. In my own personal life, Dr. Hawkins has always pushed me to think seriously about the intersections of public life, ethics, and theology. She has been a decade-long mentor. Uh, she has been a uh, decade-long mentor providing counsel to me when, uh, since she was a professor of political science at Wheaton College. She has continued to do so through graduate school, reading through essays I've written along the way that explore the relationships between history, politics, and theology. And she is who comes to mind whenever I think about the public understanding of religion, and for me is the quintessential public intellectual. Uh, so many of us are here in attendance um, because of the person of Dr. Hawkins. So if you, I don't, if, if you came here because you know Dr. Hawkins the person, could you just raise, yeah. Um, I, uh, I assign uh, the documentary Same God in my Intro to Theology courses, and we even, um, one of our friends um, who's on his, his way here has even, oh, there he is right there in the back, even created sweaters in, uh, inspired by, by Dr. Hawkins. Uh, it says, says embodied solidarity, the phrase that framed her Advent worship. Yeah, you can hold it up. Give it up for that art and for, yeah. There, there you go. Dr. Hawkins is a scholar and teacher and mentor of unmatched talent. She has been there and supported so many of us uh, throughout our own personal lives, dreams, endeavors, and relationships, is a prophetic and compassionate voice and one of the most kind, vivacious, and thoughtful humans you will ever meet. Uh, she goes out of her way to keep up with, with uh, people that she, that she loves, supports, and su continues to support her students, even all the way through doctoral work, like myself and is a person that um, I try to model my life after, someone who embodies that intersection of scholar, activist, religious leader, and human. 
And so we are so delighted for, to hear from uh, her this afternoon. So please do us all a favor in welcoming Dr. Larisha. <laughs> to be like the kindest introduction I've ever had in my life um, from someone who uh, I began calling Reverend Dr. Vega when he was an undergraduate. So, you know, I spoke, you know, I feel like I spoke that PhD into existence. I did not grow up Pentecostal, but you know, I learned the lingo. Um, but, um, and I mean that in a serious way that we were just kind of quibbling upstairs um, about the fact that I'm technically now on his PhD committee here at the University of Chicago. Um, and so it's funny because I was, uh, you know, ribbing him because he actually never took a class with me at Wheaton College. <laughs> and, um, and then he said, and I said, he said, but I'm, but I'm your student now. And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> so finally in his uh, PhD-ness, he's a student of mine. Um, but thank you, Matt. And, he didn't say this, but I kind of adopted him as a little brother too. And he was like, he, he gave me a card once that was just like, I don't, it was weird. It was basically telling me I didn't know that I needed an older sibling, but I guess I got one. So, um, cause he actually does have older sisters, but in any event, um, it's good to be here. And I say that to say that I feel like I'm amidst family. I literally used to live um, at 52nd and Drexel. And I used to, you know, jog by uh, Ellis, by McCormick all the time um, when I lived here in Hyde Park for two years. Um, also, I went to church um, for several years. My church met at, uh, in the basement of Rockefeller Chapel, for those of you who are here at U of Chicago. And then it moved over to Ida Noyes Hall. So I'm accustomed to being in um, beautiful, old, wood-paneled, buildings with molding and uh, large stately pictures of white men and maybe one woman um, <laughs> who's holding a dog. Um, but I hear Benjamin Mays is in here somewhere, so yay. Um, so um, just nodding to the lineage here and the idea that the University of Chicago is committed to um, moving conversations forward and has been at the forefront of doing that. Um, I'm a social scientist and we all owe a great debt to this institution and its work. Um, so it's humbling to be speaking here. Um, this isn't my first time speaking at U of C, but it's my first time speaking at the Divinity School. And there's also this back and forth that I have with some of my colleagues who are here about whether or not I'm a theologian. Um, I don't consider myself a theologian, um, but I do believe that we all do theology in our bodies. So I'm here as someone who is going to be speaking to you, um, not from an academic perspective. Um, I engage theology, I engage philosophy, um, but these aren't my academic homes, even as I write at the intersections of liberation theologies and black Christianities and white evangelicalism. Um, and other forms of um, now interfaith, um, which was a kind of like later adaptation. Um, the intersection of religion and politics is quite different than the kind of specific subaltern work that a lot of theologians do at the intersection of race, ethnicity, culture, and religion. Whether intellectualizing about it um, or writing about the lived experience of religious minorities and or religious majorities. Um, so I wanted to, um, I've, I was asked to speak specifically when I was invited, and, and I want to refer to this um, as a way of uh, both giving us a through line, but also saying I'm going to deviate perhaps a little bit from what my call was. Um, the call was to speak about, quote, the duty of Christians to protect the freedom of expression for religious minorities, end quote. Um, and so... What I want to do today is, yes, engage this question, but in a back way. Um, but I have to belabor the background, because you can't understand the birth of something, including my ideas about what it looks like um, to embody solidarity without getting the background. You know, why am I an appropriate choice of speaker for a series in a diff school when I'm not 
um, a theologian. I'm not a divinity professor. Um, I'm not a religious, well, I guess I am now a religious studies professor. That's weird because that's a recent innovation in my life. But background, um, nine years ago today, I earned tenure at Wheaton College. Wheaton College, in its nascency, was a part of a radical movement, the abolitionist movement. Tunnels literally filled in during the 1980s were sites where fugitive black bodies sought refuge. And this is interesting because as a kid, my idea of the Underground Railroad was of literally underground tunnels. Wheaton College had literal underground tunnels. Wheaton was the first university in the state of Illinois to admit a student of African descent. And I was the first black woman to earn tenure in the history of that institution. Thank you. <laughs> and aside, an aside, I do a lot of asides when I talk. An aside is that I had to change that verbiage, the first black woman to earn tenure, from to be granted tenure. That's how long it takes. Like Decolonizing my mind is a lifelong project, right? So that's just a parenthetical. Seven years ago, I lost tenure at Wheaton College, almost to this date, this week. Exiled into the black wilderness by white evangelical myopia. The evening of December 10th, 2015, I sat um, in a restaurant in Oak Park, Illinois, where I moved after I left Hyde Park. Um, an inferior successor, but you know, everybody can't be Hyde Park, y'all. Um, but it was good, I love Oak Park. Um, I was sitting at a restaurant, Oak Park Kitchen and Bar, I think is what it was called, having dinner with a colleague from Elmhurst College and a colleague from Benedictine University. Um, and we were speaking about the prospects for these three schools working together at the intersection of issues of peace and conflict transformation. Um, why do similar kinds of programming? Why not bring our um, efforts together? Also, Elmhurst has a hell of a lot of money. So um, I was like, like, let me ride on the tails of Elmhurst and um, engage with the Catholics um, in their thinking about public life and theology. Um, and and ex ex not just expand our programming around peace and conflict. And also, I should state another aside, this was the uh, fall of 2015, was the first semester of the Peace and Conflict Studies program at Wheaton College um, that I spent my sabbatical semester um, creating, um, I'd been creating it for years, but getting the approval for it. So going through all of the <clears throat> coursework and paperwork. So the background is also that this was all around the formation and flourishing of a peace and conflict studies space at Wheaton College, the first peace and conflict studies program also at that institution, where I was told that Jesus had a non-studied position on peace, but that's also another story. Non-studied position on peace. He just lived it, so there's that. Um, and so I want to take you back to that story, that, that part, um, that piece, of the beginning of embodied solidarity because I think it's important. So um, on December 10th, after <clears throat> dining at the illustrious Oak Park Kitchen and Bar, I came home and I wrote, tomorrow I'll wear, actually I think this is before because this is posted in um, Glen Ellen. And again, I just went back to the Facebook because you know it's, tr it's the truth about your life. Um, and so I went back to the Facebook to figure out um, what was I doing at that time. And the Facebook says on December 10th, 2015 in Glen Ellen, which means I was still at work. Or, or else I was on the train doing this on the way to Oak Park Kitchen and Bar, which is more likely. Um, I said, hey, tomorrow I'll wear a hijab to class. I invite you into this Advent worship narrative. More on Facebook later, friends. This is in a group called Women on the Faculty at Wheaton College. So I didn't remember this until I saw this screenshot this week. Um, you'll see the previous post is about the Peace and Conflict Studies program, November 30th, 2015. Um, he had invited artists in from New York and Chicago 
um, for the first programming about how artists transform conflict. And so that was also happening in the background. As a professor of political science um, at Wheaton, I was concerned about a lot of things in that moment. Um, and I'll highlight some of them in a few minutes. Um, but more, most importantly, some of the background that you need to know is that on December 6, 2015, in the aftermath of the San Bernardino shootings, um, Jerry Falwell Jr., uh, pres former president of Lincoln Liberty University, excuse me, <clears throat> in a space um, where students are captive, um, akin to a university chapel religious service, they call it convocation. Liberty is very large, it's held in a basketball gym. Um, he made a proclamation about what he would do and what his students should do if Muslims ever showed up at Liberty. He said, if they ever showed up, if everyone had what I'm carrying in my back pocket, we could end those Muslims before they end us. Meaning, if everyone was carrying, packing heat, I said, and by the way, we offer uh, gun safety classes on campus, da 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 da, -da. Um, Then we could end those Muslims before they end us. So I did what any sane person would do. <clears throat> I went to Facebook. Um, on December 10th, 2015, uh oh, computer issues. Oops, wrong one. On December 10th, 2015, a Facebook photo taken long after work and makeup had gone. Um, it was posted on 10, at 10 p.m. on the dot with an accompanying note that some saw as a theological, theological treatise, but more on that later. I wrote, I don't love my Muslim neighbors because she or he is American. I love my Muslim neighbor because she or he, they, deserve love by virtue of their human dignity. I stand in human solidarity with my Muslim neighbor because we are formed of the same primordial clay, descendants of the same cradle of humankind, a cave in Sturkfontein, South Africa, that I had the privilege to descend into to plumb the depths of our common humanity in 2014. I stand in religious solidarity with Muslims because they, like me, a Christian, are people of the book. And as Pope Francis stated last week, we worship the same God. But as I tell my students, theoretical solidarity is not solidarity at all. Thus, beginning tonight, my solidarity has become embodied solidarity. As part of my Advent worship, I will wear the hijab to work at Wheaton College, to play in Chi-Town, in the airport and on the airplane to my home state that initiated one of the first anti-Sharia laws, parentheticals, like I said, I love them, read unconstitutional and Islamophobic, and at church. I invite all women into the narrative that is embodied hijab wearing solidarity with our Muslim sisters for whatever reason. A large scale movement of women in solidarity with hijabs is my Christmas wish this year. Perhaps you are a Muslim who does not wear the veil normally. Perhaps you are an atheist or agnostic who finds religion silly or inexplicable. Perhaps you are a Catholic or Protestant Christian like me. Perhaps you already cover your head as part of your own religious, religious worship, but it's not a hijab, e.g. nuns, etc. I would like to add that I have sought the advice and blessing of one of the preeminent Muslim organizations in the US, the Council on American Islamic Relations, where I have a friend and board colleague on staff. I asked whether a non-Muslim wearing the hijab was haram, forbidden, patronizing, or otherwise offensive to Muslims. I was assured by my friends at CARE Chicago that they welcomed the gesture. So please do not fear joining this embodied narrative of actual as opposed to theoretical uni unity, human solidarity as opposed to mere nationalistic sentimentality. Document your own experiences of women in solidarity with hijabs. Hashtag wish. Shalom, friends. That sleepy selfie turned out to be significant as a performance of blackness, womanness, womanist theologies, femaleness, and faith. Of course, I wasn't thinking of all of that at the time. Seeking to live out the integrity 
of Jesus' radical message and to live into the purity of Surah 49.13 in the Quran, where the prophet, peace be upon him, says, O mankind, indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. This is a more apt representation of Babel than most Christian commentaries that I have seen, a corrective reading of, corrective of colonialist exegesis, not about dominion, but about knowing God's people. But I digress. As a professor of political science, I was concerned pedagogically with how to get my students to see suffering bodies and to move beyond their privilege, paralysis, often rooted in their positionality at a liberal arts institution. I was trying to get them to embody solidarity. I told them that our, the our theoretical solidarity, <clears throat> our fist raising, Facebook liking, head shaking, check writing, blog writing, social justice crusading from afar won't cut it. I was reminded by Jesus' Sermon on the Mount to walk a mile in my neighbor's hijab, choosing to subject myself to the denial of potential denial of civil liberties and bodily assault that my Muslim sisters were suffering was not religious sacrifice. It was embodied solidarity, placing my body amongst the oppressed. In this political landscape, Muslims were the zombie du jour, so, many Christ so that many Christians scarcely winced as that fellow Christian, Jerry Falwell Jr., instigated the murder of Muslims. And instead of walking with Muslims in their distress, rather asked me why I wasn't standing with persecu persecuted Christians in Iraq. Why would manifold numbers of Christians excoriate me for standing with my oppressed Muslim sisters? Why would they call me a non-Christian for daring to call those little hijabis and their mommies and non-headscarf wearing Muslim women my sisters? Simple. It turns out that embodied solidarity is patently political and eminently pragmatic, meaning Perhaps it's out of the box because it doesn't reform to religious convention. And in practice, it upsets power hierarchies. As I've thought more and more about embodied solidarity, um, and as we've endured not only years of a pandemic, but also um, because of the pandemic, more time to enter into the narrative and literally again see YouTube, Instagram, um, Facebook, TikTok prophesy about black life in diorama, that I'm thinking a lot more about the ways that the black body itself represents um, a dialectic. I've been thinking a lot about dialectics. But back to, um, back to this story here. It occurred to me this morning that what got me here, out of Wheaton, at UVA, non-tenured, was not a misunderstanding about theologies, about my intention, about for whom I was speaking, or what I represented. What Wheaton fundamentally said was this certain expression of Christianity my understanding of black Christianity was beyond the pale of white that they wanted to embody and still seek to embody. They said, we define Christianity. We sue the government like Hobby Lobby, but it's not politics. It's not even business. It's just Christianity. It's free expression. It's freedom of religion. And you know that religious freedom in this country has only ever been toleration anyway. Not tolerance, because that's a very low bar. But it's not just here. This is a global phenomenon. In France, egalité, liberté, sécurité only go so far. Um, in Hindu, 
Hindu nationalism has surpassed the banner of religious coexistence and Gandhian ethics. In the US, white Christian nationalism makes no pretense about the fact that its project is religious supremacy. This is not an overstatement, and the evidence is not just January 6, 2021. In spite of my black epiphany during this moment of epiphany, I want to make a fundamental claim that free expression of religion, rights on the books, rights in the abstract, they're not lacking. What is lacking is solidarity. Solidarity of an embodied, risky sort. Because religion as expressed, or mold, or lived, or codified, is always embodied, is always embodied. In fact, I believe that we need to look towards religious minorities to ask what they can teach us, double entendre intended, us in the United States, about religion, about freedom, about true freedom. Because, and don't use this because it's going in my book, freedom is a song sung best by the oppressed. Those living under the shadow of empire who yet persist. They embody the dialectic. They embody being and nothingness, hope and despair. The odyssey, not theology. Hijabis and people wearing hoodies have everything in common. Yes, it's just material culture. It's just a scarf. It's just a cotton sweater. Cloth covering heads, yet so much more than that. They are proclamations. And in the context, and in context, where all that stuff went down, the wearing of hijabs and hoodies were both mundane acts, and they were also sacramental acts of devotion. Not acts of religious freedom, per se. Not intended to be a political statement, but nonetheless, expressions of the dialectic that black bodies and Muslim bodies express every day of their being. So um, what I would like to do today um, is tell you some stories about these expressions um, to help you understand that I've already told you that this is a really heady day. It's a, it's a traumatic day, in fact. I purposely chose that date. Who am I? I? I knew that this was the week. And I was like, damn it, I'm going to go there. I'm going to be strong, and I'm going to give a talk. Oh, I cussed on camera. Sorry. Um, but it's also difficult. And so I'm putting it out there because I feel um, especially blessed, but also especially um, this is especially difficult today to be here with you. Um, and talk about the dialectic that we embody. And so because I'm in this uh, very academic space, forgive me, um, I'm not going to go uh, all philosophical on you. I'm going to give a very kind of brief definition of a dialectic. Um, dialectic is often um, used in construction and conceptualization of ideas in philosophy. It's epistemology, which just means, how do we know what we know? And so philosophers from Hegel, Sartre, and others um, have explored this notion of dialectic, and, and it flows into um, much thinking. But I like the, the theme of dialectic as I've been thinking more about how embodied solidarity works and what it means, um, because dialectic is the notion of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Two preeminent black scholars of religion, C. Eric Lincoln and Lawrence Mamaya, approach black Christianity through the lens of dialectic. And what struck me about this approach, I read this book way back in graduate school, um, and what struck me about this approach to studying black the, uh, Christianity is that in a very cultural sense and in a lived sense, Black bodies, and also I would say Native American bodies and immigrant bodies, embody the dialectic of America's contradictory ideals. 
we live on the precipice of hope and despair, Afro-pessimism, Afro-futurism. I also view my own faith in this way, a dialectic between faith and doubt. I believe um, the story, the message of Christianity, the New Testament, is one of not reconciling attention, but living in the dialectic of life and death. What does Christ's sacrifice mean except living in the dialectic of life and death and the suffering that that entails, the literal cross-bearing? Being daily sacrifices, as, as Romans 12, chapters 1 and 2 talk about. So in order to survive, I have to embrace the constant dialectic that is black life, knowing there will never be resolution the dialectic itself. So this is um, a, little, like, a little bit of a reflection that I wrote um, several years ago. Um, and it's, it's very simplistic. It's not poetry that would be published in a book. Um, but I was preparing for a talk where I talked about um, hoodies per previously and when I think about black Americans, especially young black Americans, and this embodying of the dialectic, um, it's existential also. So I'm black, so is my nephew. He wears hoodies. His mom, he never wears hoodies. His mom didn't have to tell him not to. He was the same age as Trayvon. If the first black president had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. I'm a black Christian woman. One day, a white Christian college president called for his Christian students to kill Muslims before they kill us. A day later, a white presidential candidate called for a ban on Muslims entering the country. I said hell no to holy war, but yes to the Sermon on the Mount kind of solidarity, which required me to put on a hijab and walk a mile in my sister's shoes. I'm a black woman, so all black children, indeed all children, are my sons and daughters, nieces and nephews. I bow to the divine in them. I seek to see as they see, but my white baby boys on bus stops can wear hoodies and play with BB guns, but not baby Tamir Rice. See a white boy, see a future president, see a black boy, see a perpetrator. I'm a black body with a soul nurtured on spirituals of exodus and liberation, and justice. When police see black bodies, they see zombies, unfit for faith, unfit for citizenship. I'm a black citizen with rights on the books, but Laquan McDonald was too. 16 shots and a cover-up of his execution, a fait accompli until the Oracle YouTube prophesied. I am not a Muslim, but I have worn a hijab in solidarity with them. And it costs me. But more importantly, signifying certain face in the land of religious freedom can get you killed. I'm a black Christian who decries the imprimatur of the emperor, holding Bibles up as presidents, as an unholy act of division in a world in need of prophets and priests, not populists. But I'm not here to talk politics. I'm here to talk about this dialectic that the most oppressed embody, and to question whether we're willing to hear them and to learn from them and to have them be our teachers, because this is where I learned embodied solidarity. So I'm going to show you some slides, and I'm going to tell you some stories. Um, and then we're going to have a conversation, because that's what I prefer. I talked a little bit about the formation of, um, of the Peace and Conflict Studies program. And it was in that program that, and in a senior seminar, a senior capstone on faith and public life at Wheaton College, that the phrase embodied solidarity was born. Um, but I was thinking a lot about what that meant 
before. Um, often cities have kind of public works projects where uh, they have, you know, in Las Colinas, Texas, it was the Mustangs because they've got a beautiful statue of Mustangs. So artists would make renderings of Mustangs and be on city corners. You know, if you've been to St. Paul, Minnesota, you can find all of the Peanuts characters on the street. It's meant to signify something about public art. Um, I was speaking in Berlin in the summer of June 2016, and it was bears. And this bear um, reminded me, I, I saw it and I couldn't stop thinking about um, Michael Brown. Hands up, don't shoot. People often called him a teddy bear. It was these kinds of moments. Um, these are pictures, I'll go through them pretty quickly, from Turkey, um, Gaziantep, the center, um, the epicenter of the earthquake. This is a center that was built by the equivalent of Muslim charities for um, war widows and orphans. Um, a brief story about Turkey, and this is, um, this is Gaziantep, this is Turkey. In part, I wanted to have a visual of Gaziantep. This is in Istanbul. Lots of you have a visual of Istanbul, but um, the, the kind of uh, framing of the Middle East in the United States in particular means that most people don't understand that Turkish is one of the most spoken languages in the world. And also that Turkey is a developed country. And actually that Turkey has taken in more Syrian refugees than any other country as part, not just because it's a neighbor, but out of a sense of responsibility flowing from a Muslim ethic. However much you agree or disagree with Erdogan's politics. Uh, I was in Gaziantep to visit um, this orphanage um, in a school with Syrian refugee students. And um, I met with, with uh, war widows who were somewhat suspicious until the translator told them about embodied solidarity. And then they, they opened up and began telling me their stories. Um, and I reminded him, them that I was there to learn from them. And what was remarkable about these women is that they were war widows who were caring for other people's children. They were widows caring for orphans. And I told them that in Christianity, to care for widows and orphans is the highest act of piety, and that I was there because I admired them and I wanted to learn from them. And what they said to me was, we feel like we're not doing enough. We wish we could do more. And I said, you're doing everything. This is, again, this is what, what Christianity, uh, what the scriptures define as pure religion, uh, that the, the prophets talk about this as well, not just Christianity, uh, the Hebrew prophets. And so we had a conversation, a wide-ranging conversation, um, and they prayed for me, and then they asked me to pray for them so it wasn't just an interfaith moment. It was a moment of embodied solidarity um, across languages. And at the end, I asked them through the translator um, what they wanted me to do. I said, I'm going to tell the world about your story. And they said, just ask them to remember us. Remember us. Not ask your government to provide X, Y, Z. Remember us. Remember us in our distress. That's all they asked for. So this is an example, again, of religious freedom and learning from below um, that has changed my life and helped me um, in my understanding of embodied solidarity. This is another, um, this is an older uh, Syrian who is in Gaziantep. Um, he and his entire family, um, several of his daughter's husbands uh, perished in the Syrian civil war, which is still raging 12 years later. This is his family. Um, I purchased, um, you know, 
the cheapest things I could, uh, the most significant things for the cheapest price I could. This is a t-shirt literally from CVS for $5. Um, but to bring gifts to remember. And so he's holding up his uh, Chicago t-shirt here and um, blessed me by allowing me to meet his family and to tell me of their journey. This is uh, the younger uh, granddaughter. This is a selfie. Um, so they were very proud of their selfie. So grandfather and granddaughter taking a selfie. Um, this is another family that I met in Gaziantep, um, Turkey. Um, also in a desperate situation, um, a grandfather raising and grandmother raising their children, grandchildren, um, because their uh, children perished in the Syrian civil war. So living in a room, uh, one room essentially. Sorry, this got turned around, but um, the daily, this is Gaziantep, which is now um, primarily destroyed. The call to prayer. Just to humanize um, the situation, and I've been in contact with my friends who um, are at the Zakat Foundation, which is providing relief at this moment, um, texting with him in Gaziantep there. So um, my visit there was transformational. This is Rwanda, another example of embodied solidarity. And I would say this was a key turning point um, in my life. In 2014, um, I sat under a tree in Rwanda with a number of perpetrators and survivors of the genocide. We sat under this tree for shade from the hot Rwandan sun and listened to firsthand accounts of perpetrators and survivors. In fact, they were paired. The genocide commenced on Easter Day, April 6, 1994. 20 years later, the genocidaires were being set free to return to their villages. As many of these genocidaires told me, they were hobbled by the weight of guilt, shame, and the rejection of their neighbors even the rejection of themselves. One woman, let's call her Pacifique, sat stony-faced under that tree, just as Mary stood under the cross that bore the body of her son, casting shade on her sorrow. This woman was brutally beaten and left for dead, destined to be assembled among the Valley of the Dry Bones that is the aftermath of the genocide. Pacifique, rehearsed one of many stories that day with me that changed my life. She recounted in vivid detail that day, the, that one day recently, in recent years, 2014, she was walking down one of the thousand hills of Rwanda toward a valley when she recognized a man walking toward her from afar on the upside of the hill. It was the man who had left her for dead on the first day of the genocide. As their bodies neared, the genocidaire tried to hide his face from her. She asked, do you remember me? He said, I don't know you. She snapped, I remember you. You speared me here and there and left me for dead. And I remember how you told me that my God died that day. From now on, Pacifique continued, when you see me, look at me, speak to me. I am your mother. With her terse blessing, she dignified his life and declared him her son, even though he sought to sacrifice her life on Easter Day. The eyes of her heart bent towards Jesus' vision of a radically inclusive family of other mothers and other sons, enemies made family, captives set free. This Mary of Rwanda took Jesus' words to his mother and his friend John seriously. She dares us to love lavishly, just as Mary loved her new son John, and as John immediately bestowed love on her by giving her place and prominence in a new family, his very home. This, to me, is the price of embodied solidarity. Um, and Again, I think that the dialectic embodied and black experiences and native experiences and migrant experiences are to be our example. 
So I'm going to stop there because I've got lots more stories that I could go on and on about um, and more pontificating that I could do. Um, but I would rather engage any questions or comments that you have about just more pictures of Rwanda and these scenes of um, hard-fought solidarity um, being lived before my eyes. I guess the last thing that I will say is I want to question and I want to press. Um, I've been thinking a lot about liturgies, that liturgy is an ordinary thing, and we all have liturgies of life, practices that form and shape and disciplines that form and shape who we are and how we are. But I also would like to question the things that we um, press and the people that we press to the periphery. Because prophets are always peripheral. I go to Rwanda every three or so years to learn how to be human. Prophets are not just without honor, they're always peripheral. They're not in the center of power. How are you gonna see when you're on the inside it's the outsiders who can see. Um, someone told me, um, a colleague said, I always find that black Americans tend to be the best an analyst of politics. And I said, it's because we're always on the outside looking in. Even when we're on the inside of power, we have our head on a swivel, right? Our third eyes are not blind. We've got to see what's coming or get got. They didn't want Tiger Woods in the club. They just knew that they had to let him in. They couldn't keep him out, right? So even when we're on the inside, we've got to be on the lookout. Hijabis and hoodies be on the outside. And that hones the prophetic voice. It's not that the oppressed are better. We have different vision. We're on the periphery. periphery. Our faith is always seeking understanding. And so how do we begin to live this narrative? Um, how do we begin to live more authentically in embodied ways? We look to those that we have pressed to the peripheries. And I was just in Israel, Palestine on December 15th, the anniversary of, the, um, of me getting called to the principal's office at Wheaton. Um, and I was purposely there also because it's the seventh year. And I wanted the Jubilee year to be spent in a place where I could learn from people on the periphery. I didn't spend most of my time in Tel Aviv. I did not touch a beach. I spent a, a half a day in the old city, Jerusalem. I saw the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, I walked the streets. I didn't even follow you know, the Roman road. I, I took, I snapped photos because we were walking too fast. We had stuff to do. I spent most of my time behind a wall in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is ma majority Muslim. The people celebrating Jesus there are predominantly Muslim. The Christmas festival is Muslims returning home to their ancestral land. Mary, the mother of God, would have to go through a checkpoint, and she might not be able to get through the checkpoint to get through the, to the hospital to birth Jesus. That's the reality of life on the other side of the wall. The wall is a new innovation. It hasn't always been there. And I need for you to understand that's Jerusalem. That's the old city. Notice the colonization of the Israeli flag. Holy Rock Cafe, haha, ha, that's humor. Um, but this is the wall where they bear witness to other people's pain and suffering. This is the tower. This is what occupation and colonization look like. And let's get beyond the misnomer of settlements that's what settlements look like. 
This is how genocide begins, and this is not an overstatement, if you're paying attention. This is Bethlehem. And so I went to Palestine on the year of what I'm claiming my year of Jubilee, seven years after uh, leaving Wheaton College, a place that I love where there are people that I love and people that I still love. And I'm still trying to learn what embodied solidarity looks like from those on the periphery. And my question is, are we willing to see and are we willing to hear what these prophetic voices are saying to us in our time? And in this case, um, they're literally being, um, literally being pushed um, into the sea. So, and that's not political, it's just true. So, so questions, um, comments. And I also will say um, that there's a reason I haven't written a book on this yet. It's very, it's very difficult, and it's not, it's not academic. I mean, you can ask me questions about theology and what books you can read, but what I'm telling you is go to the peripheries. It's not a program, it's not a 10 point, it's not the 10 commandments of embodied solidarity. So that's, that's what I have to share. I also want to say I think it's good news. I think it's hopeful. I think we can make progress. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful about the stories and the voices um, from below and what they have to teach us in this day, in this time. Thank you.